uh, Marcus Lagerin was nominated for the program and now is the fourth Swedish people, uh, Swed person that actually has been honored with the Java Champions program. So a warm applause for that. Thank you. Well deserved, I would say. So if I give this talk, maybe we'll see why I was nominated. <laughs> I've, been, I've been with Java for a while and, and run times for a while. Um, I'm doing this in English. If anyone, like, if there's anyone else who wants to, like, if everyone wants me to do it in Swedish, I can do it in Swedish, but this is an English talk, so interrupt me and say Swedish because we want it in Swedish. Do it now. All right, English it is then. Keyboard setup assistant, okay? Identifying your keyboard, this is not good. Um, just a moment, I'll just uh, remove all the all right, and uh, hopefully no pornography will pop up. So uh, this is a, a talk that I've given as a keynote at Java Land last year, and I modified it to uh, suit the times uh, today, 2016, um, end of first quarter. And uh, it's a personal journey uh, about my time uh, of 20 years since uh, the mid-90s in the Java space and what I've done in Java and the various things I've done in the Java space. And um, as I say on Twitter, on my Twitter profile, you can follow me at uh, Lagergren. Uh, my tweets are my own, so anything here is uh, completely uh, uh, my own opinions and aren't affiliated with my employer, uh, which is currently Klarna, uh, where I work in the performance team uh, uh, with various workloads on the, on the runtimes on our JVM-based stack. So uh, this, is, this is a story. Um, of 20 years of Java, my experiences, and uh, other people may have other opinions and other experiences, but this is my story. So uh, it's basically what I've been doing with my, my life for the last 20 years. And um, it's supposed to be an informative presentation. This is a very convoluted picture that shows the entire history of Java as, as, as one backbone from 95, when the first Java Alpha and Betas came out, and I was actually working with those when I was a research intern at Ericsson at that time, until 2015 and 2016, when Java 9 is almost finished baking, and uh, I think FC, Feature Complete, is, is, is in May now, so that Jigsaw is, is done. So we'll try to cover everything really quickly. It'll be historical, it'll be nostalgic, um, and uh, my agenda, it's basically, it's, it's, it's 2016 today, and Java's been around for 21 years, or, or yeah, 21 years, because the alphas came out in 95, late 95. Uh, so it's actually longer if you count the alphas and betas of Java 1.0. Uh, Java 1.0 was released in 96. So uh, 20 years of runtimes and, and, and Java runtimes from an engineer's experience is uh, what this presentation is about. And... Um, there once was a company in Stockholm called Appeal Virtual Machines. Actually, it was called Appeal Software Solutions, but when we started doing JVMs full-time, it turned into Appeal Virtual Machines. Uh, and that was acquired by BEA Systems in 2002, uh, the winners of uh, WebLogic. And that, in turn, was acquired by Oracle in 2008. Uh, and uh, Oracle isn't likely to be acquired by any other company, so that's the way it has remained, uh, that technology. However, Oracle acquired Sun in 2010, some when you're bankrupt. I get all this Wi-Fi join cloud that you don't see. Thank you. Um, so um, a lot of the time uh, that I've been working in Java has been on the Oracle umbrella. So I'll talk about 20 years of Java and runtimes from my perspective there and, and other places. Um, and the JVM we did at Peel Virtual Machines was a clean room implementation of Java. It was called JRocket. And I wrote a book that was published in 2010 uh, together with Marcus Hurt. And uh, we talked about JVM internals. And um, um, to my knowledge, no other book uh, about JVM internals has been published that has been gone into depth in that matter. And uh, also, about half the book is still relevant because the APIs and stuff, uh, uh, Java Mission Control, uh, is available as of Java 8. And uh, people use this. And if you want to know how runtimes work, this is a good read, even though it has a product-specific title of a, a product that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but a lot of the code base and a lot of the functionality got merged into the uh, uh, Oracle Sun uh, JVM. So this is a time travel journey. So let's, uh, let's take us back to 1995 and uh, see where it all began. 
and I uh, think we traveled a little bit too far. We get into 1984, but that's relevant too, because 1984, except for a kick-ass Van Halen album, uh, also involved me uh, getting my first computer, uh, a Commodore 64, which is where I learned to program. And uh, how many in here have used Commodore 64s? Well, it's more than half of the audience. This is a great crowd. This is a great crowd. Thank you. Um, so um, we didn't have a lot of contacts in those days. We had to write our games ourselves if we wanted entertainment. So that's, that's how I learned my stuff. And uh, at the Commodore 64, I learned that uh, below basic, there is something that goes faster. I learned that basic was basically interpreted into something that goes faster, a 6502 assembly code. And if you wrote portions with data in your basic programs, like basically encoded 6502 assembly code that the uh, manual told you how to do it, and um, um, it, or if you wrote assembly code directly, things would be really fast. It would be like 50 times to 100 times faster than the basic interpreter. So that was my first virtual machine, C64 basic. So I guess that's that, that like stuck in my mind, and that's why I got interested in runtimes in the beginning because I saw that below this basic layer that was built into the C64, there were other things. So that was a was a brief uh, diversion. Let's go to to the start of of Java. So the beginning of the 90s, there was a project at Sun called uh, Project Green, which was basically a portable architecture for home electronics. And they didn't really know where to take that, but uh, it was, I mean, originally they were doing things like programming remote controls um, in an intermediate language and like having all these kinds of leeway for uh, um, remote controls that would be really intelligent and, um, and, and business applications for home electronics in an intermediate language. It was Project Green. And this was James Gosling came in and said, maybe I can use some of my research stuff. I'm getting to that later. So um, in 94, uh, I'm still at university. And um, just to give you some perspective, when, when Java started, I scraped to get enough money to get, uh, get a high performance Minitower PC, which was the best in the market at that time, it was a Pentium 90, Pentium 90 megahertz. And uh, I remember making the observation like, wow, CPU frequencies, they're like in the FM band these days, 90 megahertz, that's huge. And uh, this, this shows how far away 1994 was. And um, at the same time in Santa Clara, uh, people have started using the word internet. And uh, the Oak language, which was the predecessor to Java, which was James Gosling's brainchild, had better applications than just programming remote controls. So what happened there? Uh, it was fortunate timing because they wanted to talk with Netscape and uh, do something like a language in the web browser where people could animate stuff and uh, show simple presentations in Apple frames, uh, some animations, a web-aware language, as they said. So they finalized a deal with Netscape in 94 and 95, which is, was really ironically, because no one uses applets anymore except for the Danish social security system, uh, but uh, this is really what made Java take off. So they had a deal with Netscape to deploy Java in the browser. Uh, the other thing that made Java take off for real was, the, was that it was actually right once, run anywhere, which was an artifact of the research. And um, you, could, you could compile Java on one platform, and we would run on other platforms as well. And uh, another, thing, another term that people used frequently in 94 was a network-aware language, and that basically uh, uh, meant that Java had an SDK that you could use to talk HTTP and other protocols. The Java Net, Java IO protocols were there out of the box, uh, and you didn't have to include them. So people predicted that, that would be huge and said, network aware language, we could code web pages in Java, whatever that meant, but that was a term that was frequently used. So this turned into 95 and 96, where the internet suddenly morphed into the World Wide Web, and what people said, the internet, these days, they meant the World Wide Web, and, and, and people used Aftonbladet and Swedish sites and like the various precursors to modern websites, Web 1.0. And Java came up with the first stable release, which was JDK 1.02, uh, which was the first JDK release by Sun, and Java was also integrated in Netscape Navigator, and this is Netscape Navigator 2.2 .2 that I used on Windows for my first uh, Java project in the summer of 96. Uh, that was a painful time. Um, so I worked with Alphas, 
of JDK 1.0 at, at Ericsson Media Lab as, as a research intern then. And uh, another comparison, a historical comparison, when you look at uh, the JDK 1.0, it fit on one of these. How many in here have used one of these or touched one of these? Okay, so it's about half the crowd again. So it's a disk, it's about 1.44 megabytes, and the JDK really did fit on one of these. So sneaker net was actually the, the, the best way to, to uh, move the JDK between computers. So I ran back and forth to KTH where I was studying at the time, where there was bandwidth, and not just my V42 bis modem at my home, uh, with floppy disks, and it actually exceeded the bandwidth of any. Uh, of any pipeline available on the net at that time. Um, the people in the queue house at KTH, this admin said that, I mean, you live close. If you manage to uh, uh, pull a coax cable with repeater to our window, we'll drill a hole and plug it in for you. So I was sneaking on the Ruslex one at night uh, with the red coaxial cable, uh, because I, I, I reasoned that the red coaxial cable, no one would ever dare cut that. And, 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 and try to sort of get bandwidth into KTH, but never succeeded because the repeater failed and I couldn't afford a new repeater. So that was 1996 and that was Java 1.02. And uh, applets was the main use case. There was a website called gamelon.com with like thousands of applets and people used applets and waving dukes. And I mean, there's a limit to what you can do on the client side with waving dukes in the Java, in the Java world, but, but there, there it was. So I did my internship at Ericsson Media Lab then, which was, was copied from the MIT Media Lab uh, template, roughly. Uh, and, and the charter was to play with Ericsson's future using cutting-edge technology to do something, cutting-edge technology to do something with media on demand. So I ended up doing something very early with Java, Java 1.0, um, a system called Mozart, which was a media on demand system, uh, basically allowed you to, uh, to browse uh, and view uh, music and videos on demand. So it was basically Spotify uh, and Netflix uh, in an applet um, with MPEG hardware cards where we, uh, we pre-scanned and, uh, and did a lot of, uh, of pre-processing, but it was there in 1996, so uh, nothing new under the sun. So under 96, Java 1.0 came out and um, it was a pure bytecode interpreted version of Java. Uh, I had a university professor at, at KTH who was suddenly really proud of his interpreted toy language. That wasn't Java, it was something else, but it's like he was really ashamed of it previously because it was interpreted, and you can't get any performance with interpretation. Uh, but he reasoned that if Java gets away with it, with the, the pool it has and the popularity it has, I can get away with it too. Uh, but it really didn't because Java was slow at this time, but, but it had popularity. And uh, the Java memory model from the beginning, specifying how Java fields and Java objects relate to each other, was broken. But that didn't stop people from using it and misusing it and the VM for doing illegal optimizations and things like that. Java has always had a language specification, but it has not always been up to date or always on par with uh, what you need for Java performance. So there are things in Java 1.0 like thread stop and all its friends that are inherently unsafe that have been long since deprecated, but not removed. I've seen new code written in 2009, I think, using thread stop, and that makes me really depressed. So who has used thread stop in Java code in here? Be ashamed. So they're all deprecated, and I hope that Java 9, when Jigsaw comes out, uh, feature complete in May, if uh, I haven't been misinformed again, um, that some of the deprecated stuff in Java will go away along with Jigsaw because it's the first large breaking change of Java. So Java 1.0 was very 1.0, to quote people on the internet. But as James Gosling put it, he said, your development cycle with Java is much faster because Java is interpreted. The compiling, load, test, crash, debug cycle is obsolete. And that's exactly the same argument that the JavaScript kid is used today who want to import anything to Node and frameworks and whatever. So I'm not sure uh, that James Gosling know what he was talking about. But um, in 96, anyway, there was a company called Appeal Software Solutions that was founded in Stockholm. And uh, all the members uh, who were currently studying at KTH had extensive Java experience, having used the language from the start. Um, so we did a lot of Java consulting, and it was a fairly new thing in 1996. A lot of people didn't do Java consulting, so to win bread, we had to do UML, um, Rational Unified Process, things I don't care to think about. I'm, I'm ashamed that it's on the historical charter, but we, we did that too, to make money. We were young and we needed the money. So that was Appeal Virtual Machines, but we mostly did Java consulting. 
So this is the first web page from 1996. You can see it's very uh, uh, one, web 1.0. And um, we even had this, this, this pie at, at the uh, bottom right corner because anyone who's watched the movie The Net uh, from 1995 with Sandra Bullock knows that every website has a pie at the lower right corner, which is a backdoor to whatever privileged domain there is. So we, we, we're sure to honor that tradition. I clicked on that and I think there was a pop-up that said you didn't say the magic word. So uh, in 97, uh, Java on the client side uh, wasn't really taking off. Uh, there was a limit to what you could do with slow flickering applets with Waywing Dukes in the web browser. However, uh, the parts of Java that did take off was the white, right ones run anywhere part because uh, and other things as well, because Java had a sandbox environment. You didn't get buffer overruns with unexplicable uh, segmentation faults. You had no pointers. You had only references. You had automatic memory management. So all these things led to fast application development for many platforms. And uh, while AWT at the time didn't look near native or was native or, or, or even adequate for anything, uh, you could still write server-side applications in Java that would deploy anywhere, and people did. So uh, people realized, even back in 97, that the JDK is a great library for development. Um, so this was the dawn of application servers. People realized that we could have state on the web, and it would be really nice if we wrote it in Java, because then you could deploy it on Solaris or Linux or Windows or whatever. So in 1997, we start to see the prehistoric trail towards Java EE, which, we st which, which still exists today. And in 1997, Java 1.1 1 1 came out, which was like huge. It pretty much doubled the JDK size. It had inner classes, it had Java Beans, it had JDBC, it had RMI, Remitted Reflections, and the first JITs. I think Symantec wrote the first JIT for Windows before Sun did. And it also introduced serialization, which, um, um, as a former member of the language, uh, language team of Java, I can say it still haunts us and, and pretty much makes everything we do horrible. So it, it was the first design mistake that was still have to support in Java. Um, and in 1997, uh, three people in this like fledging company, uh, still working at the university, uh, appeal virtual machines one trip to Java 1 at the Blickinger Technology uh, Institute of Technology, because it was a programming contest. You can see how, how young and lovable they were. And uh, they went to Java 1, all expenses paid because they won this programming contest. And uh, Sun presented the Hotspot Virtual Machine, which basically said that this is an adaptive virtual machine. Um, it will interpret everything until we find hot code, then it will JIT it. It's based on like old small talk and self-knowledge. It was an acquisition of Anamorphic that Sun did. And um, we could also adapt other things like uh, um, memory, uh, garbage collection behavior, depending on how the application works and so on, but they didn't do that. They basically started with, uh, with uh, a virtual machine that um, optimized only hot code. And we felt like for a sort of, I'm not going to say dynamic language because that term has been misused um, like to the degree of the term feminism, but dynamic language. Uh, Java is fairly dynamic in that um, mobile code can enter the system at any time. And uh, we figured this is the way to do it. I mean, if we can optimize only the code where it matters, um, adaptive runtimes, this is the ticket. So we really wanted something like hotspot technology because we had customers at the time at consultants who thought that Java was too slow when it was just interpreted. So in 98, Java 1.2 came out with Swing, which was a huge uh, uh, code base bloat, and it wasn't still anywhere near native, and it still isn't anywhere near native, so that's one of the problems with Java that C Sharp doesn't have. It's not even native looking. Uh, strict FP keyword, uh, there was a JIT in the classic JVM, so Java suddenly got a lot faster for all installations. Um, the collections API, which is still there today, and uh, from Java 1.1 to Java 1.2, the JDK tripled in size. So there was like 15, 20 classes now and 59 packages, which is like three times what they had before. So you couldn't fit it on a floppy disk anymore, uh, to my dismay, because my bandwidth wasn't growing faster at this time than uh, floppy disks were becoming obsolete. So there was a programming competition by Blekinge Tekniska Högskola, and, and, uh, and uh, our people won it again, and uh, we sent to Java 1 again. So Sun presented the Hotspot Virtual Machine again. 
and we realized that it was slide by slide, the exact same presentation as last year. So we figured, like, we can't wait any longer because our customers really need Java performance. Let's build our own JVM. How hard can it be? So at this time, we decided to uh, create our own JVM because we figured, like, in six months, we can have a working prototype. And um, we decided that, well, graphics, maybe not, but we can productize a narrower domain, so we could use a server-side only headless virtual machine, uh, because server-side applications and, and, and app servers and um, whatever came before app servers, that's what the customers run. So we need to help the early app server vendors get performance and scalability. Um, we decided not to build a bytecode interpreter, because we figured that startup time doesn't matter on the server anyway, it's just legit to compile everything. And that's a decision that we regretted a lot. We started writing an interpreter when we acquired Sun at Oracle and moved to the hotspot code base. But it turned out to be a pretty damn good jet when it came both to like producing quality code and starting up quickly. So um, in 1998, BEA, um, which was an app server vendor, acquired WebLogic. Uh, BEA basically had legacy applications written in C before like Tuxedo. And WebLogic became one of the first drivers for the uh, Java Enterprise specification. And uh, another thing that happened in 98 was that a lot of people discovered that Java was slow, so they could basically turn Java or Java bytecode into C code and compile it with GCC, and assuming that any mobile code doesn't enter the system and there's a closed world, uh, you can have a static Java compiler and it can uh, can run pretty fast. So there were a lot of products at uh, like at that time that uh, that got like 10x on Java performance uh, for any application that wasn't like dynamic in nature. So there was TowerJ, Excelsior Jet, and uh, basically they did a lot of stuff like convert Java to C code and run GCC, and it was like fundamentally compatible with the runtime language. Uh, where code can enter the system at any time, but they raked in the dollars anyway because that wasn't the use case of most people. And uh, in '99, our consulting company, APL Software Solutions, decided to like split off a couple of people and work on the JRocket uh, virtual machine, finance the development, the consulting hours, uh, and that wasn't enough. So we started hunting for venture capital. And in August '99, we sold the first part of our souls, venture capital, and started spending the nights reading academic papers about like the self guys and uh, adaptive runtimes and research that was done before. Jalapeno, which became the JAX RVM at IBM, uh, was one of the inspirations because it was a meter program JVM. It was written in Java, bootstrapped itself with a bootstrap image, and uh, ran dynamic language, uh, ran Java dynamically from that. And in 2000, in the height of the dot-com era, uh, Java is the fastest growing programming language in the world. And this was in the middle of the dot-com bubble, so it was a really bad time to start raking in more venture capital. Uh, Nasdaq hit 5,000 just before the tech wreck. It's back over 5,000 now, and I'll leave it to you to interpret what that means. But uh, uh, before that, it hadn't seen 5,000. So in order to call ourselves Java, uh, a cleaner implementation of Java, we needed a Java license from Sun. And uh, if you have a Java license, there's something you maybe pay money to Sun at this time, and they give you something called the TCK, which is the uh, technical compliance kit for Java, the test suite that you need to pass to be able to call yourself Java. And uh, also, to get a Java license, you can't just re-implement Java, you need to, to have a value add. It basically says we do something else than Sun, and um, please give us a Java license. So what's the value add? Um, how would the JRocket virtual machine that we were building um, be a value add to Java? We did cake with this motive as well. So what is a value add? And uh, initially we said, we're a server-side JVM. Uh, you haven't optimized anything. Uh, our value add is superior performance going to be much faster than the hotspot and everything. And for some reason, Sun didn't like that uh, as a value add. So we came up with manageability, which is basically something we pulled out of our asses at the time because we wanted that Java license. And um, manageability turned out to be sort of a great thing uh, after a while. Uh, it was based on the observation that if you are a runtime, you know a lot about the underlying system without actually having to mine for that information, spend, spend a lot of time mining for that information. Um, 
you have uh, things like trends in the garbage collector, which objects are growing because you garbage collect anyway, and the mark and sweep garbage collector will be able to pinpoint trends in garbage collection, like this, this object type is growing between garbage collections and things like that. Where do we spend our time? Where do we pass threads and what, me what methods? So we realize there's a lot of free information that you can export from the JVM if you own the JVM. So we basically started building early versions of Java Mission Control, which is part of the Java suite as of Java 8, already in 2002 because of manageability and because to get that Java license, which we succeeded in doing with this as a motivation. Who in here has used Java Mission Control to instrument anything? It's about half the crowd, it's great. And it's getting better. I mean, the Java 9 versions are, are, are really nice. So if you haven't downloaded Java 9, which was just me in the audience, I think, please do that and try out the JMIC uh, binary. So in 2000, um, the dreaded Kestrel JDK 1.3 came out with Hotspot finally being released as I mean, we figured like this is competition because Hotspot is going to outperform us in anything, but Hotspot in, in Java 1.3 was quite unstable and, and went into infinite loops a lot. Uh, and um, they bundled Hotspot with the JDK for the first time. They added JNDI, JPDA, RMI, Corba, Corba, which is the main source of warning still in the JDK. No one's touched since 2000, I think, 2001, Java Sound APIs. And in 2000, we also released JRocket 1.0, which as someone on the internet put it, was very 1.0 because it was good at one thing, it was good at scaling up fast on like multiple thread applications, chat servers and things like that. So we had an M by M green threads hybrid. Basically we implemented our own threads on top of, an, uh, on top of several operating system threads and that made us outperform uh, very specific uh, applications in that space. So we're actually able to sell some licenses to trading systems and uh, um, chat servers and things like that. And we're stupid enough to write it in the year-end financial statement, so the tax authority really fucked us over uh, when it came time to sell the company. So 2001, black monoliths and stuff. Um, it wasn't that advanced technologically, I'm afraid. But at that time, we broke out of the JVM development from Peel Software Solutions into a separate company called Appeal Virtual Machines. And we finally got our Java license with the manageability of value add, which is what turned into mission control. <coughs> and the static compiler mindset is still very strong. Uh, we were trying to get financing from BEA. We were trying to get financing from Intel. But Intel, especially being a hardware vendor, didn't, real, didn't understand, like, the dynamic nature of Java, why can't you just translate to C and use GCC on it, and they wanted to invest in Tower J and all those kind of companies with static compilers that didn't support the Java contract that aren't here today. So it was very hard to sell adaptive runtimes as a concept, even though the research community with Self and Smalltalk have been pushing it since like the early 80s. But we met BEA and we talked to BEA and they wanted performance and scalability for, J uh, for web logic yesterday. So we took a lot of time helping them out and start cooperating in server-side benchmarks. So they took over the discussions we had with Intel and um, basically ended up um, getting into acquisition talks with us. Intel, however, had some things going in 2001. They had the IA64, the Itanium chip, which I call the Itanic because my engineering team has spent many, many hours trying to write efficient JIT compilers for that, which is an impossible intractable problem. A lot of MP complete problems in that, writing a, an in-order compiler for a JIT and having it go fast. So um, in 2001, I was mostly in San Mateo getting uh, JRocket to run on this horrible titanium chip in binary translation mode. Uh, I had this beta titanium hardware, which was non SEC compliant. I had this cathode ray tube monitor on my desk, and it wobbled whenever I had the server running because it sent out so much radio noise. So um, sometimes you have to really sacrifice yourself for the art. Um, and the JCP came out at this time. So uh, people started, uh, like, some champion the JCP, the Java community process, with Java specification requests. So Merlin, which was JDK 1.4, was the first release that came out of the JCP where people supposedly uh, were, were, were like contributing in an open source way, where in reality it was sort of controlled by Sun. 
So in 2002, Java 4, 1.4 Merlin came out um, with the assert keywords and regex and the ability to do exception get cause. Nio, which was modeled on Solaris, so they had to redo everything into Nio 2. The logging API, which is global singletons, image IO, XML, IPv6 support. And in 2002, on Valentine's Day, BEA also acquired Appeal Virtual Machines without any Intel involvement, which we're really <laughs> grateful for, but we still had to spend time, time working on IE64. So they asked us, how do we make money? And we found four value adds for Java uh, during this time that we actually made money on uh, when we were acquired by BEA. And some of them are actually relevant for the Java community today. Um, the first value add was very simple. We just added support. BEA had a multi-tier support process for WebLogic already, so we added that to the JVM, which Sun didn't offer. So conservative customers like Japanese banks used JRocket, which was uh, like a more unstable product just because they could have this support. So that was a simple value add. And the second value add was manageability of the early mission control. We started working on the JSR 174, which is monitoring which we had really good ideas uh, about, but Sun messed it up, of course, as they're prone to do with things. And um, the management console is the first part of uh, the Java mission control to get out there. It could basically attach to a JVM in real time and see what it was doing with uh, zero overhead. And um, at this day, 2003, 2004, some hardware observations are in order because clock rate curves start to flatten out. Moore's law, is not completely true with the doubling of uh, processor capacity every 18 months. Clock rate curves start to flatten out, so the world is moving to multi-cores in hyper-threading or NUMA or other implementations of that. And uh, Java still has and would have for a long time explicit threads, which requires the program programmer to like explicitly handle parallelism, which in 2016 no one would expect to have to do. Uh, we also realized, as I said with Itanium, that in-order execution is a bad idea for JITs. Uh, to schedule instructions for the CPU to interpret them uh, from software, that's an MP-hard problem. And um, you really don't want to be the JIT to do that. So it's easier with x86 that also was like out-of-order execution. And uh, you, you put the instructions in the pipeline, it would do the best thing that could by it. Uh, and, and execution time as in, 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 in a dynamic, langu uh, dynamic language environment is runtime overhead plus program runtime. And program runtime is what you want to maximize. Uh, runtime overhead is what you want to minimize. And runtime overhead is, is, is garbage collection and JIT compiling methods and whatever. So in 2004, uh, JDK 5 came out. This renumbered the schemes now, so it's not 150 anymore. It's Java 5, which was codenamed Tiger. It was JSR 176. Uh, it was the biggest Java release so far. It involved generics, which cost some legacy like bridge methods and horrible things in bytecode that probably most of you don't have to um, suffer, but those who work with bytecode are uh, stricken by bridge methods even today. Type erasure annotations, which is like the key, the backbone of any Java framework today. Um, Autoboxing and unboxing, which is uh, the bane of performance anywhere in Java today, because people assume it's free. It isn't, and the hotspot still doesn't remove it very well. Enums, varags, static imports, and the Java util concurrent package by Dougley. And finally, the Java memory model gets fixed, which is probably doesn't matter a lot to you Java programmers, but to us JVM implementers, it mattered a lot, because a lot of the uh, uh, JVM JIT optimizations that we could do were technically illegal before, weren't anymore. And also AMD released a competing architecture, a uh, 64-bit architecture, competing with the Intel Itanium here, still 64-bit, the x86-64, but it was backwards compatible with x86. Uh, and this is like, for the first time in history, AMD eats Intel's lunch because everyone wanted this, adopted this, and they forced Intel to re-implement this architecture on their own chips, and they called it EM64T in the beginning. So that must have been immensely humiliating, but this was like the first proof of concept that Itanium didn't work as a 64-bit architecture. Um, so adoption was immediate, wide register bandwidth, but backwards compatible with x86, twice the number of registers, and uh, with 64 bits, you have exabytes of virtual memory space. 
and this was the time that I will refer to as the benchmark wars. It was BEA with the JRocket JVM, Sun with Hotspot, and IBM with J9, and we spent man years and man years uh, on various artificial benchmarks here, more or less artificial. We spent time on SpecJBB, which is a server-side benchmark, SpecJAP server, and so on, trying to beat each other. And um, um, there were lots of benchmarks that management liked because benchmark scores are easy quantifiable management goals and you could put numbers on them and you can assign bonuses if you perform well on benchmarks. So um, spec JVM 98 was like the CPU bound benchmark since time immemorial and there was spec JVB 2000 and 2005 was spec J app server which you could score better on if you spent a couple of million dollars on a Cisco switch for your, uh, for your setup. Uh, but as I said, running SpecJBB 2005 and those benchmarks is a quantifiable management goal, so we spent a disproportional amount of cycles on that. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is it actually brought real-world optimizations, because the things we did to run fast on SpecJBB 2005, some of it scaled out and actually made Java faster for all kinds of server-side implementations. So There's a list that I'm not going to go through, but we invented a lot of stuff these years just to make these benchmarks go faster that actually had a real real world use cases for real world server side applications. And if you're interested in the details of this, all of this are covered in my book that I presented in the beginning. We were the first with compressed references, for instance, which is called compressed oops and hotspot, which basically means use 32 bit pointers if you can, because that saves a lot of register bandwidth and cache bandwidth. And we forced Hotspot to implement these because we had a 30% gain on SpecJBB 2005 uh, before them when we implemented this. And uh, if you want to know why the Hotspot code looks like shit, uh, it's our fault because they were really stressed out when they had to make this and it was really, really built for it. And of course, that's the code base that wins. So, uh, all this, all this real world performance for a few semi synthetic benchmarks. Uh, and that was actually good. There was an upside to this. So the competition led to Java server-side performance being pushed to where it's never been before. Uh, performance releases, uh, where you like, have a benchmark score and you have to publish in three months, uh, the bits that did that aren't always great for performance, though, as the support teams uh, well know. Sun cheated and used an XX aggressive flag that people still use in production that basically says, never garbage collection, like, never garbage collection unless you absolutely have to. And people, for some reason, think this and it looks like this, this is an industrial uh, performance flag that they use. So there are support errands on this. Uh, and meanwhile, at, Peel, at Peel Virtual Machines, we decided to build value add three, deterministic garbage collection. We needed a quality of service level for pause times when we talked to a lot of telcos and investment banks and customers with trading systems, things, things like that, who wrote stuff in Java. Uh, modern applications, they want low latency rather than a throughput unless you run like midnight batch jobs. So if we were able to provide a quality of service level and say that no pause time would exceed this, uh, the telco and financial sectors went wild and would really pay for this product. So we implemented deterministic GC. This is garbage collection, the 95th percentile of garbage collection pauses uh, without deterministic GC. And this is with deterministic GC, and this was in 2004 with JRocket. There are some warm-up artifacts there. So we were actually able to write the garbage collector that had work packets that were sort of atomic transactions on a database that were able to be rolled back, rolled back if we didn't have enough time to complete them. So the total garbage collection time would be longer, uh, but we were able to like, provide a pause time guarantee for most applications, the bound being the amount of live data on the heap. And up to like half the heap of live data, we could actually uh, implement this pause target goal that you set from the command line. So we sold licenses for that, and we made a lot of money from that. And also in 2004, the uh, monitoring JavaX management API got finalized and mission control shipped with its first sharp versions. Uh, we provided production time uh, monitoring with uh, zero to very low overhead, depending on how much monitoring you wanted. Uh, limited flight recordings at that time. Today we have flight recordings for everything. And it was ex extremely cheap to get this data because as I said, we just used the uh, data available from the runtime already. 
We did a latency analysis tool at this time where you can see where the application doesn't spend its time. It's part of the mission control suite today. Basically, where are threads parked, where are threads locked, things like that. If you haven't tried it, you should really try it. Because uh, things like locks that force threads to execute in series is really simple to see. We had a memory leak detector that hasn't been ported to hotspot because reasons, mostly because of the garbage collection code, uh, which is horrible. And uh, where you basically could go into a trending object on the heap and see from where it was allocated, which object allocated this object, and which object in turn, and what source code line was it, and there was an Eclipse plugin, so you could jump to that source code. So now we're at half time, but I'm about two thirds through the presentation at 2005. We've done 10 years of Java. Uh, what we notice here at halftime in 2006 is that Sun isn't doing all too well. Um, Sun is basically at this time betting the entire company on Java FX, basically in mobile phones, phones or anything, we, everything. We haven't seen iPhone, uh, we haven't seen Android, but they want everyone to jo run Java FX. So they go to Google and say, look, what a great idea. And Google thinks that's fine, we'll steal it. We're not going to pay you anything. So uh, that's all Sun is doing. So it gets a bit quiet from our side of the scene. Another thing that happens in 2006 is the Apache Harmony project is founded, which is basically another JVM project uh, where they rewrite the classes from scratch, clean room implementation with the Apache license because GPL is toxic. Sun was uh, open sourcing on the GPL because they had to, not because they wanted to. And IBM and others contribute a lot of code to this. And uh, Apache Harmony asked for a Java license, which it didn't get. Uh, because the field of use restrictions claimed weren't compliant with the GCP rules. So a lot of fights in the Java community process, which is basically controlled by Sun, but pretends to be fully open source, ensue at this time. And Sun is forced to open up the JVM, JDK sources, and the GPL v2. And 2006, which is the last release for a long time, Sun releases Mustang, JSR270, which is Java 6 which is JavaX scripting using the Rhino scripting engine, the compiler API, JDBC 4.0, and dynamic languages on the JVM. People start talking about JSR 2.92, which is the invoked dynamic bytecode at this time, because the trend is that people try to deploy all kinds of things that aren't Java on the virtual machine already in 2006. So dynamic languages are becoming trendy, and JRuby leads to growth. And BEAI and Sun are all in the process of working with the dynamic language spec. And we contributed as BEA substantially to that spec. Um, the polyglot JVM effort, the JVM being able to be a multi-language runtime, which is what I worked on for the last four years, uh, say one, starting to be coordinated. And, and, and Bytecode is basically serialized Java as, as, as the mindset, so there's no runtime, only dispatch, so we need an invoke dynamics, so we can implement dynamic languages with the semantics. And, and uh, even at this time, people start rewriting all the things in JavaScript, and, and that's even worse today. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a trend that's becoming worse. So if we can implement JavaScript on the GVM, we might be able to save some of that, but I can't say that's a good trend, or it's, it's a trend that will, uh, will be sustainable. Another thing that happened in 2006 is that virtualization is becoming trendy, and uh, we realized that the JVM is just a specialized operating system for running Java. Um, we started doing a value add, our fourth value add, which was basically doing a, an operating system that could only do one thing, run the JVM, run the JVM process. And because we knew that the JVM was the only thing running on that uh, operating system, we could use the hypervisor on the virtualized system for, uh, for uh, device drivers and we could, um, could cut a lot of middleman code like OS network code, you could do that directly, you could do most of it in user land and you wouldn't have to do a lot of ring changes and privilege instructions to the OS because when you look at stuff, if you're an application server running on a JVM, running on an OS like Windows, running on a hypervisor, running on hardware, you really have three abstraction layers, the JVM, the OS, and the hypervisor, the general purpose OS there. And if you could substitute them with one, we could like potentially get a lot of performance, something that just runs the application server on the hardware. So we did a linker and realized that a lot of what the JVM requires from the OS, that's like not that much. and 
we could virtualize Java on a virtualized Java operating system by removing abstraction, implementing zero copy I.O. because we could do a lot of stuff in user land instead of kernel land. We didn't need to copy I.O. buffers. We could minimize the syscalls into the kernel. We could implement threads, our own threads. We had to implement our own threads because we implemented our own operating system that protected their memory from other threads, which provided cheap read barriers so we could do really fast pulseless GC or low latency GC. And the hypervisor provided the device drivers. So we were heavily encouraged by uh, the investment banking industry to do this. So we started doing that operating system stuff, which was sadly shut down because Oracle didn't like VMware when they acquired us in 2008. Um, Apache Harmony in 2007 requested TCK to be Java compliant, and they wouldn't get it. And they started blocking every vote in the JCP, the Java community process, so it stalled. And uh, JRocket needed to hedge his bets because we were still independent and uh, we implemented a Harmony version that uh, we're actually able to run after a few months. And um, Sun, getting desperate, started wanting to pull our Java license because they think that we don't have a value add anymore and because we can. Only IBM has a lifetime Java license. Uh, uh, so Sun was really suffering and betting their ship on Java FX, and there were no language updates for the foreseeable future, even though they promised Jigsaw even in Java 7, and Java 7 they promised in 2007, and that didn't happen. Um, so in 2008, Oracle acquired BEA, and um, JRocket Engineering started working closely with uh, Exadata and the Oracle server stacks, and JRocket became the default Oracle JVM for uh, whatever server-side loads they had. Um, and Oracle forced the move from VMware to Zen for JRocket VE, which ultimately killed that product because Zen was not ready for production quality uh, deployment at that time. It was written by college kids from Cambridge at that time, and they changed every API and every point release, and Larry didn't want us to talk to VMware. Uh, but what's worse is that in 2008 and 2009 there was a political vacuum, and Sun was in serious financial trouble and there were no Java releases, and they were doing Java FX, and really senior people who were working garbage collection on Sun basically were reassigned to be forced to be QA for Java FX and things like that. They hired people in Russia at the sixth of the salary of a people in Santa Clara and said, you're the new QA, learn everything, and, and, and other things you do when you're desperate and, and uh, flapping around. So in 2010, Oracle acquired Sun because they could, and uh, for good or for bad. Um, they decided to merge the code bases with the JRocket VM and Hotspot, and Hotspot would be the dominant code base because it had the widest market share. And JRocket VE, as I said, was shut down because uh, Larry doesn't like VMware. And at that time, uh, I realized that Sun were basically five to 10 years behind what we had at Oracle at the time, both in continuous deployment and continuous integration and software development and testing. And a lot of people left. Uh, you ended up with a lot of like old people at Sun who used VI to do three-line uh, code changes and didn't have a modern approach to software development at all. So a lot of people, including me, quit and uh, left the Java scene at that time. Um, so I did a startup, uh, basically building media-on-demand systems um, for, for the television industry um, for a year or two, uh, which, as most of you probably your job descriptions are transforming XML into other kinds of XML. And I'm sorry, that's your job descriptions, but that's the majority of the IT industry. And uh, I didn't really like that. Uh, in 2011, there was sadly still no Java release since 2006. And they said, like, Java 7 would have Jigsaw and everything. IBM retired Harmony and officially joined the Open JDK. That was good. Um, and they lured me back and said, like, come work on the language team and work in Java 8. You don't have to delve into the hotspot source code, which was state of the art in 1995. You can, like, work in Java 8 and write new source code and work on Lambdas and the Java 8 language and evoke dynamic and dynamic language runtimes. So I came back to the Java language team in 2011. And Oracle forced out Java 7, Dolphin, Plan A, as opposed to Plan B, basically get out what we have don't wait until Jigsaw is ready in uh, July in 2011. 
And uh, it was the initial native implementation of Invoke Dynamic. It was pretty buggy. It had compressed oops as default, which we had for several years in JRocket. It had Project Coin try and resource switch on strings and various other syntax implementations. It had Douglas concurrency utilities finalized, and it had NIO2, which was another Solaris like API. But interestingly enough, when finally Java got out here in 2011, it was extremely well received by the community. And there was sort of a tipping point here from community goodwill. Basically, everyone said Oracle will kill Java, and Oracle uh, sucks, and Oracle is evil, and Sun is good, even though they haven't released anything for seven years. Uh, and, and Oracle's second Java one in 2011, there was like a real difference between the one in 2010 and 2011, where people said, like, we have Java 7, and you're committed to do something. And architectural observations here are in order. We still have backwards compatibility. Java will always maintain it. Uh, some things might change. Jigsaw might actually be a breaking change, the first in JDK history. Uh, but fundamental compatibility will always be there. Uh, I don't have time to demo the binaries of, of like a, a project I did at KTH in 97, which I brought that I built in 97. I wanted to run them with Java 9 because it runs them. I tried today, but I had to limit my time. It works. So it's backwards compatible. And that's like what, why Java is still around today, like one of the big factors why Java is still around today. So 2011, 2010, Java 8 development really started picking up speed. We started the Nazarum project for JavaScript and other dynamic languages on the JVM. Uh, all the stuff that would have to do with mission control, the serviceability layer, were ported to Hotspot. So we could actually release mission control as part of Java 8. And we started like getting rid of the horrible build and test infrastructure that Sun had and replacing it with something they could rely on. So 2013 was pretty crunchy for me and the Java language team. We worked on Java 8, Java 8, Java 8, and there was this huge security backlog that went away. I think there were like 250 security bugs or something that had piled up on Sun that were fixed during 2013 uh, with security updates. And Java 8 was released March 18, uh, 2014, it was the biggest and best Java release ever. It removed the perm gen, which is something we did in JRocket. The type annotation, unsigned integer math, repeated annotations, the date and time API, and the Nasdaq scripting engine. And we had Cake again to celebrate that. And um, anyone who's programmed Java 8 here knows that Lambdas make your code vastly simpler. Who has the fortune to be on a Java 8 or a, a newer code base here? It's about half the room again. So like all the questions they ask is about half the room. Great, great for you. Because constructs like this would turn into constructs like this and, and, and are much simpler. And you can also have a, a parallelism implicitly just by doing a stream, a parallel stream instead of stream. And the build process, if you want to build and play around with the OpenJDK today, just like do configure and make, and it takes five minutes, thanks to a hero called Fredrik Arström who said, look, this is a work environment hazard to me that it takes 45 minutes and I have to bring in all these different things. It has to be self-contained. And he sat down and he did it and management let him. This is a huge breakthrough for productivity for Java 8. So that brings us to today and the end of the talk. So Java 9 is in the works. Jigsaw needed six months of additional bake time, so I think the FC is still in May. Uh, there's a REPL, finally, for Java. This is one of the most exciting Java things uh, for several years, uh, the JShell REPL, Project Color. Uh, I think that actually JEP286, I'll like today, might make it in. We have Scala-style Scala var and val in Java. Uh, like type inference, you don't have to declare the type on the left-hand side of an assignment. And instead of final, 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 you can just type vol or const or whatever it will be, but I think it's going to be vol. Um, you have EC6 support for NAS or and performance improvements for dynamic languages in the JVM. And the future holds project Valhalla, value types and stack allocations, foreign function interface, getting rid of JNI, which is horrible, and turning it into something the way it should have been written, project Panama. Arrays 2.0, long indexes, deterministic and low latency GC again, finally in hotspot, and more open source JVM implementations. J9 on IBM is open sourcing everything they do, which is really exciting. Those of you who were at JFocus might have heard Charlie Gracie talk about their open source offering. They're still stalled with lawyers, but any day real soon now, we'll have J9 open source implementations to work with. And they've also made it pluggable. They've implemented Ruby on that. So. I would say that Java is vibrant again today. Java 8 is awesome. Java 9 had an awesome Java 1 2015 and uh, joined the JCP. So that's all I had to say for today. Any questions or uh, am I out of time, Matthias?
This was my personal story. So here I am. So maybe you should do a question. Does anybody have a question from, from Marcus? Yes. Uh, I think that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make it necessary. Like everyone uses AWS today, and uh, there's virtualization offerings in the cloud. And uh, there's Cloudius, there's Azul, there's like various commercial offerings that do similar things. So uh, I don't think that there's any development cycles at Oracle spent doing it. Yes. What do you think about the future of the architects and growing teams? Like when you get the fifty or two hundred gigabytes. Yeah, that's the most important research area: the garbage collection and growing heaps, especially with large live data sets. It's 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 obviously that's where the future is heading. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.